Well, we're on our way to Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. Now you might say, what in the world does Disneyland have to do with the theme of the Toy Man videos, which is screwing around on a very high plane? Well, if you were to ask the Disney Studios the origins of Disneyland, they would probably say, well, it all started with a mouse. And if you were to talk to Disney detractors, they'd say, well, Disneyland was started by a couple of multi-million dollar entertainment corporations. Now, both of those statements are completely true. But if we really wanted to get down to a more irreducible truth about the concept of Disneyland and where Disneyland came from, you'd have to say that Disneyland started with a bunch of guys screwing around with model trains. Disneyland is probably one of the most recognized locations in all of North America. And I think most people know something of the story of Disney's desire to build a family-oriented theme park. Now the theme of the Toy Man videos is people screwing around on a very, very high plane. Now you might say, what does Disneyland have to do with someone's desire to just plain screw around? Well, the actual backstory into the creation of Disneyland does reveal a good deal of screwing around on the part of Walt Disney and a lot of the other people involved in the creation of this park. Disney and many of his friends were model railroaders and the original concept of Disneyland was simply a large model railroad, a giant train ride. Years before building Disneyland, Walt Disney and several of his friends had constructed a major ride on railroad in Disney's backyard. Ollie Johnson was one of several animators at the Disney Studios who was also deeply involved in live steam model railroading. Johnson had a rather large 1 12th scale railroad in his yard and used to give rides every weekend to neighbors and friends. Another interesting character here is Chad O'Connor. O'Connor was a mechanical engineer and was best known for developing a fluid head tripod for motion picture cameras. He developed this so he could get better shots of trains. Disney contracted with O'Connor to build several of these for the Disney Studios to use on their documentary films. And the O'Connor fluid head tripod is still manufactured and is considered to be one of the finest camera mounts available. But O'Connor's first love was anything steam powered, especially steam locomotives. He had restored or rebuilt just about every kind of steam contrivance that there is. In the 1960s, he was contracted by the U.S. government to build replicas of the Jupiter and the 119 for the Golden Spike National Historic Site. But the rail fanatic that had the largest influence on Disney was Disney animator Ward Kimball. Kimball was into one-to-one -one scale locomotives. He was constructing a full-size three-foot gauge railroad in his backyard. And his wife Betty was a co-conspirator in this. In fact, she bought the first locomotive. Ward and Betty started off with just this beautiful 260 locomotive and a really nice but really beat up coach. It was an enormous amount of work, but soon they found themselves with a real live working railroad. Walt Disney was incredibly passionate about everything he ever did, and as these friends pulled him more and more into model railroading, here too he became a true fanatic. Once Disney had decided to build a 1-8 scale live steam railroad in his yard, he wasn't going to rest until he achieved perfection. He constructed a brand new house around which to build the railroad on Carrollwood Drive in Holmby Hills. The track plan included a long underground tunnel to take the trains under Mrs. Disney's flower garden. The line's one and only locomotive was known as the Lily Bell. It was actually a model of a Central Pacific locomotive. 
Disney enlisted the aid of Roger Brogy, who is one of the machinists at the studio, to build the locomotive. The boy in this picture is Michael Brogy, Roger's son. Michael became something of a fixture around the railroad and later on a fixture around Disneyland as well. The railroad became known as the Carrollwood Pacific and was a huge hit with live steam enthusiasts. Here we have Walt Disney perfecting the high art of just plain screwing around. Walt Disney and Ward Kimball became close friends and co-conspirators in the area of live steam railroading. The Disney Studios had this movie set, a train station left over from a film, and Disney allowed Ward to take it back to his house and use it as the depot on his Grizzly Flats Railroad. Another co-conspirator in all of this was rail historian Gerald Best. Best worked for a lot of the movie studios, helping them to find steam engines to use in movies. Best found two plantation engines, one for himself and one for Ward Kimball, and brought them back to Kimball's property for restoration. Kimball turned his into this engine that he called the Chloe, which was ideally suited for use in his backyard. Kimball soon became a victim of his own success as thousands of people wanted to come over to his house and ride on his trains. Disney was running into the exact same problem on his railroad. He had his railroad open every Sunday, and more and more people were showing up every weekend and wanted to play with his trains. He even had to put in a small parking lot to handle overflow traffic, none of which was very popular with his neighbors. Both men really wanted to share their railroads with the public, but the logistics were becoming a real problem. Soon, they started pushing around the idea of building a railroad at the studio, which could be open to the public. They headed off on a road trip to the Henry Ford Museum, known as Greenfield Village, to get ideas for their railroad. And it was there that Walt ran into this steamboat ride, and he fell in love with it, and decided that he wanted to have a steamboat ride as part of their railroad. It soon became obvious that none of this was going to fit on the property at the studio, so they went off looking for land near the studio to build their theme park. The rest, as they say, is history, as the idea mushroomed into something way bigger. Well, as everyone knows, the proper land materialized in the orange groves of Orange County. Millions and millions of dollars were raised and spent on the massive theme park. Well, it sort of seems like the railroad and the steamship ride ended up taking a back seat to all of this other stuff. The reality is that they were moving along under Disney's direct supervision. Initially, two steam locomotives were constructed from scratch. The number one, which was a recreation of the Lily Bell, only this time in 5 8 scale, running on a three-foot gauge track, and the number two engine, known as the E.P. Ripley, designed to look like a slightly more modern coal-burning locomotive. This one became Disney's favorite. Two years after the park opened, the number three engine, known as the Fred Gurley, was constructed out of a plantation engine, which had been acquired by Gerald Best. The following year, another plantation engine was converted into a locomotive. This time the number four, or Ernest S. Marsh, locomotive was added to the line. Both of these engines were constructed by Roger Brogy, who built the original Lily Bell. These locomotives served the park for over 50 years, but in 2008, a fifth locomotive, the Ward Kimball, was added to the fleet. This was converted from yet another plantation engine. 
The Ward Kimball was the first locomotive on the line that wasn't named after a Santa Fe Railroad executive. The E.P. Ripley became Disney's favorite locomotive. Now Disney also had a small apartment in Disneyland, and on some mornings he would get up, put on his engineer uniform, and head over to the train station and take the E.P. Ripley around the park all day, pulling passengers. Disney tried to talk Ward Kimball into giving him back the uh, Grizzly Flats Depot. That didn't go over very well. So he built an exact reproduction of the Grizzly Flats Depot here at Frontierland. Now it's interesting to note that the trains and the riverboat ride were the personal property of Walt Disney. They did not become part of the corporation or the park. These were his personal toys and he wasn't going to let the corporation have any control over them. Anytime anybody rode either the steamboat or the railroad, Disney got one dollar for that passenger. This railroad remained as Walt Disney's personal hobby railroad, just like the Carrollwood Pacific had been earlier. A reproduction of the original Lily Bell is on display in the Main Street Station, and the actual locomotive is on display at the California Railroad Museum in Sacramento. Well, there you have it. The history of Disneyland the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad, the Grizzly Flats Railroad, Walt Disney, Ward Kimball, and this amazing story of how Disneyland actually came into existence. For what it's worth, Michael Brogy, the kid in the one picture, is still involved. He's started a group called the Carrollwood Society, and he's written a great book on the subject, and you can find it on their website at carrollwoodsociety.org. Also, it's worth noting, I think, that the uh, Carrollwood Pacific Railroad did eventually get moved to property near the Disney Studios. It was moved into Griffith Park just across the river from the Disney Studios, where much of it still resides today. Uh, Disney and some of these guys were founders, co-founders in the LA Live Steamers, and that railroad is still operating over at Griffith Park every Sunday just like it did when it was in Disney's backyard. Well, I'm not sure how you found these videos on the internet. I hope you didn't find them boring. Do subscribe to the YouTube channel, like me on Facebook and all of those kinds of things, and look for more videos because we have plenty more coming up every single week.